Guys. Now, I don't know about you, but under lockdown, I've never appreciated the natural world more. The pressure release of spending time in parks and gardens and out of doors has been keeping all of us going. And that is the topic of our next session, which is entitled Nature as Salve. Yeah, this is a very, very special um, session. We've got actor Simon Russell Beale and poetry curator and author Ali Aziri, they're doing a video and then there will be a live Q&A, which I know that you'll all want to send your questions in. You can do that using the chat function on the right of your screen. So sit back and let them soothe you with their thoughts. Naught may endure but mutability. Writing in 1816, the romantic poet Percy B. Shelley may as well have been summarising the experience of living in 2020, a year in which the only constancy so far seems to be that everything is unprecedented and imminently changeable. The things that were once so familiar, so certain, meeting friends, families, lovers, going to work, travelling, are now subject to a near ceaseless state of flux as we continuously adapt ourselves to the demands of an indiscriminate and unpredictable pandemic. But while such ever-present variability may be largely alien to our day-to-day -day lives, it is a defining feature of the natural world, which is never at rest, never predictable, and invariably altered by the caprices of the seasons. If we want to learn how to cope with our new state of constant fluctuation, we could do a lot worse than going outside and observing nature in all its mutable beauty. Or even better, we could find a pleasant shady spot in which to sit and take in the transcendent words of the great poets as they distill and make sense of the myriad wonders of nature. All the poems that you will hear today in this event titled Nature as Salve, look at the ways in which our outdoor landscapes soothe us by enabling us to better understand or otherwise escape from the exigencies of our daily lives. But the title also takes on an additional meaning in these times. As any Latinists or fans of Gladiator surely know, Salve was the greeting of hello in Roman times. And now, after months of indoor confinement, we're finally at a place in which we're happily able to greet nature once again. And what better time to properly reacquaint ourselves with nature than autumn, which is now upon us. It is a season characterised by its vibrancy and variety as it oversees the transition from the lingering heat and brightness of the waning summer to the cold and creeping darkness of the forthcoming winter. And indeed, most of the poems that will be recited today by the peerless Simon Russell Beale are taken from my new anthology poem for every autumn day, which not only salutes the joys and fiery majesty of autumn, but offers pieces of consolation that will hopefully speak to you in times of need. Among the following poems and extracts are some of the most famous lines ever written on nature's capacity to inspire inner peace and reflection, and other lesser known pieces which find in nature an endless source of optimism. Some are pithy and light, others are expansive and sprawling. All exalt the virtue of nature as self. But all are different. After all, naught endure but mutability. This introductory piece is a poetic hors d'oeuvre. In it, Emily Dickinson playfully advocates for a life as insouciant and uncomplicated as that of a stone. How happy is the little stone 
that rambles in the road alone and doesn't care about careers and exigencies never fears, whose coat of elemental brown a passing universe put on and independent as the sun, associates or glows alone, fulfilling absolute decree in casual simplicity. Edward Thomas wrote Adelstrop on a steam train as he travelled to visit his friend and fellow poet Robert Frost. Inspiration struck during a brief and unscheduled stop at the eponymous Gloucestershire hamlet, which awed him with its natural beauty. Yes, I remember Adelstrop. The name. Because one afternoon of heat, the express train drew up there unwontedly. It was late June. The steam hissed. Someone cleared his throat. No one left and no one came on the bare platform. What I saw was Adelstrop. Only the name. And willows. Willow herb and grass and meadow sweet and haycocks dry. No whit less still and lonely fair than the high cloudlets in the sky. And for that minute, a blackbird sang close by, and round him, mistier, farther and farther, all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. Wordsworth provides the perfect solution for anyone yearning for the outside world, but unable to go outside. His poem, famously known as Daffodils, shows us the pleasure we can access with our inward eye as we think about the beauty of nature from indoors. I wandered, lonely as a cloud that floats on high or vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way, they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. The poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye that is the bliss of solitude, and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Poetry and nature share a capacity to chronicle the past as well as offer consolation. Carl Sandburg, poet of the First World War, employs the power of both as he folds a dark history into the landscape. Pile the bodies high at Austerlitz and Waterloo, shovel them under and let me work. I am the grass, I cover all. And pile them high at Gettysburg and pile them high at Ypres and Verdun, shovel them under and let me work. Two years, ten years, and passengers ask the conductor, what place is this? Where are we now? I am the grass. Let me work. 
The universality of nature allows it to connect us with people and places far away and from long ago. Here, Gavin Hewitt is jolted back 25 years by a game of hide-and-seek in Richmond Park. Lying flat in the bracken of Richmond Park while the legs and voices of my children pass seeking, seeking, I remember how on the 13th of June of that simmering 1940, I was conscripted into the East Surreys. And more than a quarter of a century ago, when France had fallen, we practiced concealment in this very bracken. The burnt stalks pricked through my denims. Hitler is now one of the antiques of history. I lurk like a monster in my hiding place. He didn't get me. If there were a god, it would be only polite to thank him. Robert Frost's most famous poem is about the necessity of choosing. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other, as just as fair and having perhaps the better claim because it was grassy and wanted wear, though as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by. And that has made all the difference. We all know the thrill of seeing a rainbow, but perhaps nobody has articulated it better than William Wordsworth. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began, so is it now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old, or let me die. The child is father of the man, and I could wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. Haikus give us little aha moments, a moment of awe at a wonder of nature. These lines from Japan, the home of the haiku form, are a testament to the power of brevity. Bad tempered, I got back. Then, in the garden, the willow tree. Mary Oliver is one of the most widely read poets in America today, and her work is lauded and famous for the careful attention she gives to the natural world. Here she directs us to the catharsis that can be found in listening to nature, asking us to notice the messages of affirmation and encouragement which are continually broadcast, only waiting to be heard by those who seek them out. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies, and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you, like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. A committed environmentalist, Wendell Berry has maintained a farm in Kentucky for much of his life. This poem, 
summarises the appeal of that humble vocation, which through its closeness to nature offers him constant reassurance. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night of the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. In this extract from Shakespeare's late play, the aged wizard Prospero laments his past exploitation of nature in the service of solidifying his power. Ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes and groves, and ye who on the sands with printless foot do chase the ebbing Neptune and to fly him when he comes back. You demi-puppets that by moonshine do the green sour ringlets make, whereof the you not bites, and you whose pastime is to make midnight mushrooms, that rejoice to hear the solemn curfew, by whose aid weak masters though ye be, I have bedimmed the noontide sun called forth the mutinous winds, and twixt the green sea and the azured vault set roaring war. To the dread rattling thunder have I given fire and rifted Jove's stout oak with his own bolt. The strong-based promontory have I made shake, and by the spurs plucked up the pine and cedar. Graves at my command have waked their sleepers oped and led them forth by my so potent art. But this rough magic I here abjure, and when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do, to work mine end upon their senses that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth, and deeper than did ever plummet sound. I'll drown my book. E. e. Cummings is a familiar name to many as a radically innovative modern poet, but he was also occasionally inclined to draw on more traditional religious language. Here, linguistic experimentation meets divinity in his exaltation of the beauty of the world. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day, for the leaping greenly spirits of trees and a blue true dream of sky, and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I who have died am alive again today, and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and of love and wings, and of the gay, great happening, illimitably earth. How should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing, any, lifted from the know of all nothing human, merely being doubt, unimaginable you? Now the ears of my ears awake, and now the eyes of my eyes are opened. We've all been missing our friends throughout this year. Stevie Smith immortalised the feeling we've been longing for in just four short lines about going for a stroll with a close companion. The pleasures of friendship are exquisite. How pleasant to go to a friend on a visit. I go to my friend, we walk on the grass, and the hours and moments, like minutes, pass. Our final poem sends us to our respective corners of the globe with a feeling of unimpeachable peace 
as we look forward to one day seeing the places we always carry in our hearts. Although circumstances might prevent us from reaching them, the power of poetry to make our favourite spots in nature feel so readily present means, so Yeats seems to say, that we are already halfway there. I will arise and go now and go to Innisfree and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honeybee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore, while I stand on the roadway, or on the pavements grey. I hear it in the deep heart's core. Hello um, and welcome to the Q&A part of this event. It is my great pleasure to introduce the greatest actor of his generation, Simon Russell Beale, to the Q&A part. Hello, <laughs> Simon. <laughs> um, Action. Thank you. I thought we would maybe start with saying to people where we were, where we got to film. Um, well, it These was wonderful poems. It was in North. I love the the shot of the taxi. By the way, I've not seen that. <laughs> Why fun. that taxi was there in the north of Wiltshire? I don't know. Um, it was in the north of Wiltshire. It's in a place called Martinsell, and it's a sort of series of high ground. I think it's the highest ground in Wiltshire, and it looks over the Pusey Valley. It's 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 a very very beautiful place, as you saw. Um, it was so beautiful and thank you for taking me there because it was Simon's idea that we filmed up there and it fit the theme of poetry and nature and that was such a gift. Um, it was a good day. <laughs> it was a really good day. Um, I wanted to talk to you about your sort of acrobatic facility with language because to most of us we are not we don't have an innate magical ability at verse speaking. And, but sometimes I'm hoping that from this event, it might inspire people to want to read poems out loud. They might want to read one to their beloved, or they might be asked to read a poem at say a wedding or a Burns night dinner. Yeah. And I wondered if you would be willing to share some tips on how best to read a poem. I mean, I've, I've always, read poetry aloud. I mean, I, I, I went to a school where that seemed to be encouraged. And then of course, um, I had a teacher at uh, my big school, my senior school, um, who got me acting very early. So, and he was a great Shakespeare fan. So I suppose it's part of my life. And I think it's a funny thing reading poetry, especially out loud to other people, because we know very well that um, actors sometimes are not right for a poem to be read out loud. And sometimes poets aren't right for a poem to be read out loud. So there's a sort of happy medium, which I'm not sure I get um, uh, often enough, which is between presenting the poetry as neutrally as possible and giving it a bit of shape. Um, uh, fun enough, the first time I ever thought, I, I heard myself do Adlestrop, which we heard just now uh, on the radio, and I heard my recording of it. And that was the first time, this was after 20 years of reading and I thought oh no that's that's I'm pleased with that because it was sort of neutral enough to not have my personality impinge on it but it was also respectful enough of the shape of the poem yeah so yeah people say sort of don't get in the way of the poet yes with the poem and, and, but you said something interesting to me the other day that I wanted to um help 
um, like, and uncover more, that in um, similarly to when you're doing this, a speech in a play or when you're reading a poem, that you follow the argument. And I want you to try and uh, I, I explain remember, that. I remember saying that to you. I think it's very important. I, th I think that comes from probably doing a lot of Shakespeare because you have to find the logic of the of the piece. And normally a poem will move towards a final statement, won't it? And I'm thinking of the Wild Geese poem that we just heard, is that that's where she's leading, the poet's leading to the, the moment of saying, you find your own place in the world like the Wild Geese. And that is where the poem must lead to in your mind, that anything else is, is a step on the way of, of a logical argument. And I think once you've done that, um, then all the, extra bits, the beauty, the, the coining of a particularly marvellous image are sort of added extras. But you need to get the, the argument out there clear first. And Shakespeare in his plays, of course, his characters are speaking verse most of the time, and they are trying to persuade people of something. Um, uh, so therefore they're employing an argument. And the, the most concise version of that, I suppose, are the sonnets, which are not dramatic at all, but they are um, presentations of a very, not necessarily simple, but a very clear argument. There's a statement, there's another statement, then there's a contradiction, and then there's a conclusion, or a, uh, not necessarily a contradiction, but a, a change of focus. So if you get those in your head, then I think you're well on your way. Um, and in a sonnet, you well, often have that moment when it says, but, or, and yet. Yes. And then you know you're, oh, that's the conclusion. That, yeah. And I think that's heading. more important if you're reading out loud at a wedding or um, a funeral or whatever, to get that clarity of thought in your head first, uh, before you start worrying about whether you're making it beautiful or not. Because the beauty, I suppose, is principally in the argument, is what I'm saying. Yeah, that's such a good tip. Did you have particular teachers along the way um, like in your RSE days or at um, drama school? I had, I've mentioned already my teacher at um, my senior school who was a fantastic director of, fantastic English teacher, but he was a fantastic director of drama. And he was also very um, strict about exactly what I'm saying. He was very strict about getting the thought clear before you do anything else. And then at university, the same thing happened. I met a, a chap who was a contemporary of mine. I mean, he was brilliant. And he sort of was very keen to cut away any of the um, fat right. on, the, on the argument and get the uh, logic uh, across. And then at the RSC, we used to have, I, I think they still probably do, um, sonnet classes we used to spend a couple of days just looking at sonnets because it's a very good lesson way of learning how to um, do exactly what I'm talking about um so there were sort of various stages along the way but it's about it's about I think in my head and it's it's probably got more acute over the years it's about pairing away really and not when you have to do very very famous speeches like to be or not to be yeah <laughs> um and I know every Hamlet has had the same feeling in their head, which is, my God, this here it comes, this great whopping famous speech. And of course, the, the temptation is to do something with it. And that's the last thing you should be doing. You should be doing the, the state of mind the man's in and presenting it as clearly as possible. Um, so I think that's probably what, if I've learned anything from great teachers, is, it's that. What Find the truth. Find. Finding, not getting in the way, not getting in the way of what the poet wants to say, I think. I mean, it's as, I mean, to be or not to be is a very interesting one because it's, uh, it's so famous and um, I sort of knew it before I ever had to perform it. It's one of those sort of speeches. And uh, you suddenly realise when you're doing it that there are certain nodes in that speech that are of incredible importance to the speaker including sleep for instance in that case you know he goes on about to, to you know death is like sleep and if you sleep you dream and and so the idea of sleep became extremely important when I did it and that was the focus 
of the whole thing. It was about, I want to sleep. I'm tired, actually. Hamlet is tired and would like to sleep. Um, <laughs> that's a very simple emotional state to be in. It's not, it's not overcomplicated. So just focus on that when you're performing it. The, the simplest possible option, I suppose is what I'm saying. Um, what um, I wanted to ask you was that at the beginning of your career, you, um, you were, well, it, earlier in your life, you were a choral scholar and then yeah. you nearly went into a musical um, career and then you swerved and became an actor. But <laughs> how has your musical yeah. background fed into your um, acting well, or your verse speaking in particular? Well, as I've hinted already, I'm really frightened of the idea of becoming a, a, a voice beautiful type of performer it's a real it's a real trap to fall into and uh, I don't I don't think I have a particularly beautiful voice but and I know people who do but that's but um you can sort of indulge in the sort of cello playing of of speaking this beautiful stuff you you get in love with your own rendition of it um so in a, in a way the music training was all about other things it was about well I, I was a singer so fun enough breath control has always been part of my life since I was a boy um so I suppose that had a huge help I think I think more in large structures like a verse play I think it has more to do with um trying to understand the pace of a piece so the large structure. So it's, you know, a, a great Shakespeare tragedy is similar, I suppose, to a, a symphony, you know. So if you're going to do a slow movement, you'll have to do a, a fast movement next because otherwise the the whole thing becomes monotone. And I, I, I think there probably is an awareness, perhaps in the back of my head of something like that. But from word to word, I don't, I don't regard it in the same way as I regard music. Um, it's not about making a beautiful sound. Yeah. What um, we've got um, a question that's come up um, from someone watching. How did you decide which poems to learn and which to read? <laughs> well, that's a very interesting question because it was yeah. quite a late um, decision, the poems. And um, if I'm to be brutally honest, I, I learned the ones I wanted to learn, <laughs> the ones I like most. The, the great ex, um, uh, discovery on that day was Wordsworth. And I thought, well, I'm, I must learn, uh, I'm on the lonely as a cloud. And you think, a bit like to be or not to be, you think, my God, this is a poem I know in the back of my head, if not accurately, uh, and I've known it all my life. It's a masterpiece. It's an absolute masterpiece. And it's so much more, uh, again, the argument is so much more nuanced and subtle than I thought. I mean, I, I assumed it was about just wandering around looking at flowers, but it's not, it's not. It's about solitude, it's about remembering, it's about not, the, the, it's not about the active process of looking at daffodils, it's about the idea of remembering it. And of course, this is a, something Wordsworth was, I know, fascinated by, but if you learn it off by heart, you suddenly realize what an extraordinary, um, detailed poem it, it is and how um, uh, subtle and brilliant it is. Uh, the, the, the Shakespeare I knew anyway, um, the Prospero, because I'd, I'd played him a couple of years ago, but then I'm afraid I, I'm afraid I just chose the ones I really wanted to first. <laughs> and as you know, Ali, there was one poem that I wasn't particularly keen on. Yeah. Um, There's many people's yes. favourite poem. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah, so there, it was basically, I went down the list as far as I could, starting ones I like best. <laughs> I think that what the, the I think the words were um, that you did so brilliantly, and also it just seemed to chime so perfectly for lockdown and the way that yes. Juliet, the director, directed it. Yes, yes, yes. That actually, you know, what he's actually saying, which again, um, maybe nobody ever stops to think when they first hear it as a child what the poem actually meant, which is yes. I draw on the memory of these daffodils when yes. I'm inside. Yes. Yes, exactly. And that's what I hadn't realised until I... That, that's the other thing about learning poems, and uh, it has inspired me doing this, to try and do this a bit more regularly, which is actually sit down and learn one. Um, there are various famous actors who used to 
off the top of my head, I can't remember who said they'd le- try and learn a poem, you know, every so often just to keep the brain active. But actually, it's more than that. Uh, the idea of saying, um, uh, I'm going to learn it because that's the only way you really get to know it. Um, I mean, Adelstrop, which is, is, I think, probably one of my favourite poems ever. Um, and part of the reason why I love doing it on in that location was because we saw across the Vale of Pusey the whole of Wiltshire opening up like a, you know, as the poem does across Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. And uh, I've always loved that poem. So I thought, well, I might as well use the time productively and learn it properly. Um, whereas the road not taken, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but Wordsworth's <laughs> father encouraged him to learn poems and he said it would be a golden store of yes. poems in well, your it, head. It, it, but it's it's more it's 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 more even than um having a store of sort of things to fall back on. It's it's more I don't think you ever really understand a poem unless you learn it off by heart. And you it's it's like learning a part in a in a great play. You 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 know you find discover things just by the process of of again following the thought through that you never thought when you were reading it um yeah out loud. So I always rather admire academics who study plays and have to edit them and and really study them because I I can't imagine they could ever know it unless they've learned the whole thing. Um, <laughs> and they're very But I think you're, well, you're maybe in a luckier position and you've inspired us all. I think we have to wrap up now, but I hope that people oh, yeah. watching will think um, that they go off and learn poems by heart because, and then they can have a golden store of poems in their head too. I'd like to leave everyone with that thought. And thank you so much, Simon, for reading for us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, we feel so much calmer now having watched that beautiful video and talk with Ali Aziri and Simon Russell Beale. I mean, there's something about them, poetry and nature, that is the perfect thing for this point in the day. Uh, Claire is also a massive nature fan. In fact, last weekend she wrote the well, story I'll, in I'll, FT Weekend magazine. Show, not, not to show off my own words, <laughs> um, you understand, but to show off the amazing illustrations, which you can also view online um, at FT.com, done by Ian Bott, who is our graphic artist. He normally draws killing machines and spitfires and, you know, planes <laughs> and things like that. I mean, he's, he's a big aviation specialist. But under lockdown, he got really into bird watching and knew that I was um, into it too. And we were talking, this is how this article came together. And um, he thought he'd look into the data to see how many people had been noticing nature more mm. under lockdown. So we thought, well, you know, what can we do? We went to the RSPB. They'd had an explosion in um, interest in their website, how to identify birds. He also asked the wildlife trusts yeah. what they had seen big rises in. Second most read um, web page how to identify animal poo. There you go. <laughs> and from thinking, what's that? <laughs> from animal poo back to nature. I believe you've started it, I mean, back to poetry. I believe I, you started it with a quote. I did, I from... did. Sorry, I should talk about poems, not about animal poo. <laughs> um, I started it with the, the lines from the poem Leisure um, by W.H. Davies, which you may remember from your school days. Um, what is this life, if full of care? We have no time to stand and stare. Because under lockdown, we did, or some of us um, did, have the time to stand and stare. We weren't on the 8.42 to yeah. Waterloo. We were able to hear the dawn chorus um, and not have it interrupted by, you know, aeroplane noise or traffic. And for, for many people, it's just, you know, been this new dawn of appreciation of nature. So we really, really hope it lasts. Anyway, up next, we have a very special session for you coming up. Reed Hoffman and John Thornhill. It's going to be a big one. Don't go away.